So welcome to the Corrales Arts Center's first salon of 2022. Our topic this evening, seeking truth and reporting it. And joining us from Santa Fe this evening will be Sarah Solovich, executive editor of Searchlight New Mexico. I'm Kathleen McCleary, and I'm a member of the Corrales Arts Center's Salon Committee. And yes, that Omicron variant means that we have yet another salon via Zoom. But I want to get you ready for some really fascinating stories about our state. Um, first of all, though, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, Sandra and Arnold Farley of Corrales, for generously making today's presentation possible. I want to introduce our speaker. Sarah Solovich came to New Mexico just four years ago, but as you'll soon see, she and her reporting team at Searchlight New Mexico now know the state very well. Sarah's credentials are extensive and impressive. She's written for the Washington Post, Esquire, Wired, and Politico. She has reported on education and the courts for the Philadelphia Inquirer, on health issues for the San Jose Mercury News and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, She's also written a book, and her book is called A History and Memoir of Stage Fright. It's called Playing Scared, and it was published by Bloomsbury in 2015. Now Sarah guides and edits the work of Searchlight New Mexico, and it is a nonpartisan, nonprofit news organization dedicated to investigative and public service journalism. Its aim is to have an impact to inspire New Mexicans just like you and me to demand action to solve systemic problems across our state. Sarah supervised Searchlight's launch in January 2018 with what was called the Child Wellbeing Project. It was an investigation into the plight of children and families in New Mexico. Now, though, the organization's reach has extended far beyond that. They cover racial and economic inequities, government corruption, and of course, the devastating impact of COVID-19. But before we get to all of that, you all know I'm a journalist, so I wanted to pose the question of what is news? And when people ask me that, I say that if I describe a story to someone and the feedback I get is, gee, I didn't know about that. Well, that's my reaction to a lot of the searchlight stories that I read. I always learn something new and something important. So I will stop there. And I will welcome uh, Sarah Solovich, and um, I'm going to turn my own video off and my microphone off and let her take it away. Good evening, everybody. Thank you to, for everyone to, um, for having me. So the way I like to describe Searchlight New Mexico is that we're a purpose-driven newsroom, not a profit-driven newsroom. We're funded by foundations, philanthropists, and readers who recognize that journalism is intrinsic to democracy. I like to tell my reporters that the kind of journalism we practice is not simply investigative journalism, but slow journalism. And like slow journalism, like slow food, it requires time and good ingredients, which in our case translates to deep reporting, vivid details, strong reporting, and writing and editing. That's more of a challenge than ever before as newsrooms around the country have been cut to the bone. In the US today, 171 counties are without a single newspaper and many of the newspapers that do exist are essentially ghost newspapers, publications in name only. They continue to be published, but their staffing is so dramatically diminished that they are unable to report on their own communities. And that, I think, goes a long way in explaining the lack of civil discourse and increasing polarization in American politics, or as the Aspen Institute recently called it, information disorder. Because if we can't even agree on what's true or not, if we don't know what's happening in our own backyards, we can't begin to come together and face our challenges. Searchlight launched four years ago founded largely for the purpose of addressing this new reality. Its mission was to roam the state, dig deep, and change the world through the power of storytelling. Our first major project was child well-being, which may at first appear to be a narrow premise for an investigative journalism organization. In fact, 
we see child well-being as a window, a wide lens to look at everything worth examining in New Mexico. Education, access to health care, criminal justice and incarceration, gun violence, the environment, climate change. Our small team, we're 10 people, spent the first year beating the drum week after week and month after month, reminding readers that New Mexico ranks 49th or 50th in the country when it comes to every metric on child well-being. And lo and behold, our work from the beginning had significant impact. It became clear that it was helping to drive the political conversation as November's 2019 election approached. Our stories were picked up and are continue to be picked up by every newspaper in the state, as well as on TV, radio stations, and national publications such as The Guardian, Rolling Stone, Slate, and Der Spiegel. Our influence since then has only continued to grow. An analysis of the past 18 months showed that one of every four searchlight stories resulted in major impact of one form or another. Legislative policy changes, the introduction of new laws, uh, triggering state and federal investigations, et cetera. That's a really high rate of return. As a journalist, you never know what story is going to resonate with readers and serve as a call to action. We publish one piece a week, and when we commit our resources, we always do so with an eye to whether at least it holds a potential to affect change. Um, Kathleen, I think the next slide, yeah. So one of the things that I think makes us unique in the world of online nonprofit journalism is our commitment to photography. Don Usner, pictured here, is a renowned photographer, a native New Mexican who specializes in black and white photography. His work has a rare and lovely quality that's immediately recognizable. He also has the ability to fade into the background so that people almost forget he's there, which is quite a trick given that he's very tall. When I first arrived at Searchlight, I took one look at his work and I realized I'd won the jackpot. Together, we decided that Searchlight's look would be dominated by his black and white photography. And we did that because we believe it gives us something unique. It sets us apart. It underscores the gritty and straight talking nature of what we're taking on. Plus, we believe that black and white photography can be a thing of real beauty. And just because we're writing about difficult subjects doesn't mean the aesthetics should be ignored. So consider the photo shown here of the old woman in the floppy hat surrounded by children. This is a photo that illustrated a story about the overuse of antipsychotic medication of children in foster care. It's a national scandal, but New Mexico's hands-off approach over the years has been particularly lax. Our reporter, Amy Lynn, covered the story and in doing so spoke at length with this grandmother, grandmother of four children who had been placed in foster care following the murder of their mother. She spent months trying to wrest them out of foster care. And when she did, she discovered that the kids were being medicated with grocery bags full of drugs, all authorized by their official custodian, Children, Youth and Families Department, or CYFD. She gave us permission to use her name, but not the kids. And then at the very last minute, she refused to allow us to photograph them. We were on deadline. We really didn't know what to do. But Don was there and this was his solution to show the children with their backs to the camera and the grandmother's face hidden behind a big brimmed hat. The story published in 2018 had a major impact. It forced a complete overhaul by the state, requiring CYFD, the agency that was the kid's custodian and solely responsible for their over-medication, to finally revamp its psychotropic medication policy after years of ignoring the problem. Next slide, Kathleen, please. So we found, however, that many of our most important stories don't lend themselves to photography. An example is our recent set of stories about Signal, the encrypted messaging app used by state agencies to flout open records laws. 
Now, I realize that might sound a little wonky, but in fact, it addresses an incredibly important subject, the flagrant disregard of open records laws and a slap in the face to all our democratic principles. Like so many stories in New Mexico, this one involved CYFD, the department tasked with overseeing foster care and child welfare in New Mexico. Back in the fall, our reporter Ed Williams got a tip that the agency for months had been encrypting and routinely deleting its communications on a daily basis, making much of its work essentially untraceable. Attorneys and child advocates told us that the problem not only violated state um, open records laws, it hampered any investigation into the department, which for years has been subject to lawsuits and massive criticism over its management of the foster care system. Here, what CYFD was doing was in essence, no different than putting official documents in the shredder at the end of every business day. Think Watergate. So what they were also doing was a fourth degree felony. And when we published these stories, the impact was swift and severe. The state attorney general's office launched an investigation and the very powerful secretary of CYFD, Brian Blaylock, pictured here, who had been brought with great accolades to New Mexico from California, was forced to resign. It was one of the biggest impacts our reporting had in all of 2021. Moving on. Some of our most in, um, significant stories in the past year have looked at the problems of education posed by the never ending pandemic. When the virus hit, tens of thousands of Native American students in New Mexico lacked the high speed internet and devices required for remote learning. Sunny Klachishiligi, I finally can say her name, um, whose family lives near Shiprock, immediately realized what was at stake for the thousands of kids on the Navajo Nation who live without internet access, computers, cell service, and basics like electricity. In fact, to give you an idea of what this means, the common Navajo or Diné word for cell phone can be loosely translated as that thing you use while spinning around. Sunny focused her story on Evan Allen, a 16 year old boy who every morning drove five and a half miles to the top of a hill above a local trading post. He's right here, you can see him. Um, the nearest spot where a decent internet connection could be found. For nearly 10 hours every day, he sat in his car attending remote classes to turning in his homework assignments, answering teachers questions just so he could go to school. And the next one, yeah. Um, a few months later, a few months later, Sonny followed up with a story about how scores of school children in the Four Corners region had disappeared from the attendance rolls since the start of the pandemic. Some were pulled out of schools by parents who felt angry and unsupported, transferred to other district, often crossing state lines to do so. Um, other kids were switched over to homeschooling or dropped out of school altogether. The result was hundreds of children who wound up missing or unaccounted for, and none of them appeared, no one appeared to be looking for them. And by the way, this is a story that still hasn't been fully told. The COVID crisis has been an education catastrophe for millions of children across the country, particularly those who don't have a stable place to call home. Searchlight is currently working on a piece about homelessness in school children in New Mexico, including the thousands who've been lost to the system only because they live in cars or motels, stay in homeless shelters, couch surf, or double up with relatives. Though we started with a focus on child well being, COVID demanded that we do a fast pivot. And within months of the initial lockdown, we decided to launch Hitting Home, a series that chronicled the impact of the virus on five New Mexico towns, Shiprock, Gallup, Las Vegas, Carlsbad, and Anthony. The idea that we had was to return to these towns again and again over the course of a year 
bearing witness and producing multimedia portraits, stories, photos, videos, audio files to show how small town New Mexico was being affected. So we began with Shiprock, the heart of the Navajo Nation, which bore the brunt of the virus's first wave and where so many people took sick and died. Our stories highlighted a return to agricultural values, the threat to children, elders, and above all to Navajo women who are always front and center when it comes to making things happen on the nation. Research from the United Nations shows that women worldwide have proven more vulnerable to the virus. And that's especially true on the nation where women are the main caretakers and where conditions of poor healthcare, poverty, trauma, and high rates of illnesses like diabetes abound. Oh, and just one other thing about the Shiprock stories, like every story we publish that has anything to do with the Navajo Nation, we had it translated into Oral Diné where it was made freely available to native owned radio and TV stations across the country. To the best of my knowledge, no other organization in the US does that. I believe there may be one in Canada, but I'm not even sure about that. Um, so then we moved on to Las Vegas a town which before the pandemic was already in severe economic decline. And what we found was something somewhat optimistic. It was having a bit of a comeback because by our third visit back there, we began running into young people who were busy creating new businesses to support their town. They were helping with the census. They were starting and building up local businesses, opening restaurants and food trucks and getting involved in city government. Honestly, it was kind of sweet and inspiring. Didn't expect it from Las Vegas. Then uh, Gallup, that was a whole other story. Um, as our reporter Wes Fippen wrote, just as COVID-19 preys on the vulnerabilities in your body, it exploits the vulnerabilities of a community. Gallup, which borders the Navajo Nation, of course, quickly became the epicenter of the virus with infection rates that were the highest in the country. In an effort to contain it, Governor Lujan Grisham sealed off the roads in and out of town in May, 2020. But even that had its own repercussions. Gallup is a critical economic hub for the Navajo Nation. And it ha also has a history of historic racism. Um, though it's really a small town, every weekend it typically swells to double or triple its size, filled with almost all Navajo shoppers. Because as it turns out, there's only 13 grocery stores on the entire Navajo Nation a land that's the size of West Virginia. Um, so while the 10 day lockdown was deemed necessary for public health, many Navajo interpreted the governor's order as an implicit message. Gallup was locked to outsiders. And in Gallup, it was clear who that meant. Moving on now to Carlsbad. Carlsbad near the Texas border has always wished it was in Texas, but never more so than during the pandemic. Unlike Northern New Mexico, people here took vocal opposition to the governor's mandates for social quarantining, masks and vaccines. And I'd like to just quote one paragraph in our story about this. Welcome to Carlsbad one of the most defiant and incongruous places in New Mexico. It is a Republican stronghold in a blue state, a speck in the desert with outsized clout. Nothing about it suggests vast wealth, but it sits atop one of the most productive oil fields in the world, a fabulously rich basin that makes the Carlsbad region the most powerful in the state, able to boost New Mexico or betray it. Even a small economic hit to Carlsbad can mean a gut punch, a gut punch to the rest of the state. And finally, the little town of Anthony. A one-time colonia, 
Um, Colonia, by the way, for those who don't know the definition is an unincorporated low income area, which is um, often without basic infrastructure like paved roads, running water and electricity. Well, Anthony sits on the border of Texas and it's widely known as the breadbasket of New Mexico. Ironically, however, as our reporting showed, it was where food insecurity and outright hunger counted among the major outcomes of the pandemic. So moving on from heading home, a whole different approach to storytelling was our recent eviction series. It was seven months in the making and it grew out of a one of a kind database. When it was completed, we made it available to every news organization and advocacy group in New Mexico that was interested in trying it out. Because it was the first time that statewide eviction data had been gathered, analyzed, and published to identify which landlords are evicting tenants. And I have to tell you, when we first envisioned the series, I imagined that we would publish a rogues gallery of serial evictors. Um, instead, what our data found was that the top evictors were not individuals, but corporate landlords. The data also found that hundreds of tenants in Albuquerque alone were evicted or threatened with eviction during the first four months of the moratorium when the Federal CARES Act specifically prohibited landlords from even filing an eviction notice. And by the way, it's important to understand the difference between a legal and illegal eviction during this period of time. An illegal eviction was one in which the landlords around the country were forbidden from evicting or even filing an eviction notice against a tenant who couldn't afford to pay their rent. The moratorium was never intended to apply to tenants who were, for instance, fighting, um, making a lot of noise, dealing drugs, or for that matter, even undocumented workers or felons who'd been released from prison and returned home to live with their families. As the state of housing here in New Mexico and across the US grows more and more fragile, urban centers have become a landlord's market. Evictions have been ramping up for minor infractions, like allowing family members to couch surf terminating leases without explanation and raising rent. As a result, 20% of New Mexico renters recently told the Census Bureau that they didn't think they could make next month's rent. And I think, do we wanna move on to Doris Hamilton? Do we have a slide on her? Yes. So I've been told that many of you here might be interested in the story of Doris Hamilton and how she fell into the system known as adult guardianship. Nationally, one and a half million elders live under the power of a court appointed guardian, a system that can strip away a person's entire independence and funnel their savings into the pockets of lawyers and guardians while leaving them vulnerable to abuse. Across the country, it's estimated that $273 billion in assets are tied up in this system. So down in Las Cruces, Doris Hamilton was caught in this web. We wrote about her case and her son Rio's attempts to extricate her in a lengthy article last year. After a nearly two year legal battle, Rio was recently appointed his mother's guardian. Last week, was it last week? I think it was this week, past week. Don Usner visited mother and son and will be publishing that follow-up in a photo essay next week. You can look for that on our website, searchlightnm.org. And now, um, just to wrap up before I take questions, um, I wanna tell you that every year we publish a compilation of our best stories in a magazine format. It's really the only time we print our actual work in house. And that print publication is coming out next week. I'd be happy to send each of you here a free copy. And we've posted a sign up page just for this event 
So please do sign up here. It's searchlightnm.org forward slash sign up forward slash Corollis. And now if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer whatever I can. Thank you so much, Sarah. We really appreciate all that you've given us. And I think um, Deborah Blank must have a question because she's on screen. Go ahead, Deborah. I do have a question. How, how do you and your staff deal with all these depressing topics emotionally? You're the, you're the second person who's asked me that this week. <laughs> <laughs> It does get really depressing. And I've been hearing here and there of journalists who've actually left the field because really? of that. But I think for us, the fact that we have our stories so often have impact and we feel that we are making a difference for the better. It's so gratifying that it actually gives us the strength, you know, and, and fortitude, really, to, mm -hmm. to just continue with this work. And I also have to say that as a journalist, I'm kind of like a mushroom hunter. I just love the hunt. You know, it's I've always been like that. And when I'm told no, it just makes me want to dig deeper. <laughs> right. Uh, I believe you've been here four years. And Sandy Farley asked, what brought you to New Mexico? Searchlight. It, it was really that obvious for, for me. Um, you know, I'd been working as a magazine reporter and I had um, done a lot, you know, I'd written a book and I was just really bowled over by this whole new model of journalism because it's been a very depressing field for the, really the past 10 or 15 years. Um, and suddenly, like, there was just this sense that really valuable stories could be written, that we could take our time, that there wasn't going to, you know, we weren't going to be um, in this, in, we, nobody was going to demand that our stories were going to, you know, that, that we would just write stories to get clicks, that we weren't going to be covering the Kardashians, that if somebody had a great idea for something, then it was, you know, the resources were there to, um, to make it happen. That's such a rare thing, you know, in this world, I probably would have gone to Timbuktu to, to do something like this if that was the, had been the only opportunity. Tell us just a little bit about that, Sarah, because investigative journalism takes a long time, which means it's not cheap. And you combine that with this extensive data journalism. How, how do you make that work on a financial basis? It's a, it really is a challenge because I believe that in order to create a whole new entity like Searchlight, you have to become known to people. Um, you have to have a presence. You basically have to brand yourself. And so it's important to have a story every week. That is the goal that I like set out for ourselves when we launched in, in 2018. But that means that reporters who may need or want to spend, you know, months or weeks working on a single story have also got to juggle that, you know, like a, a more ambitious piece with something, you know, shorter term. And so not every story we do is investigative per se. Some of it is explanatory journalism. Some of it is narrative. I mean, we try to do a combination. We do a lot of where I mean, we probably should even do more photo essays um, with Dawn as a, a resource for us. Um, but I don't know that that's, you know, it, it's I cracked the whip. <laughs> it's probably what, what it comes down to. Your staff um, is is full time, or and how do you choose them? Well, we have ten full time equivalents, so most of them are absolutely full time. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, occasionally we'll get, we have an intern from the University of Maryland um, in which like her, I think 40%, no, 60% of her salary is paid by the university. They have an investigative um, journalism center on campus. Um, we've also participated with Report for America, which essentially works like, you know, Teach for America and places um, journalists in newsrooms around the country. Um, but the majority of the staff is absolutely, yeah, full time. And how do I, you know, how do we do it? Um, when there is a position available, we sometimes will have a national search. We've done that. Um, sometimes I'll get a wonderful intern. Um, I, I got somebody was um, interned for us from IAIA. What does that, um, that stand for? The Institute of American Indian Arts. Those arts. Arts, I think, yeah. We had a marvelous intern this past summer. Her name's Annabella Farmer. And um, as soon as I had a little extra money, I hired her full time. So it just, it varies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kathleen Brown has asked, what are the sources of your funding and how do people typically learn about you? Well, the sources are, the main source, our largest and most generous funder is the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, and fortunately, that was an organization I had some, you know, really wonderful contacts. Actually, what happened was um, there, one of the top people there was a former editor of mine at the Philadelphia Inquirer. And there was a point where we became, we were really stretched thin and um, it looked like we were going to have to fold. And I called my friend up, my former editor, and he saved our bacon. Um, so that, I'll, yeah, that's, that was, and they've continued to fund us for years now. So that's wonderful. Um, what is the second part of that question? Well, you know what, it was um, how people know about you. And it actually goes to a question that I had as well, which is, you give away so much of this material for free to these organizations like Rolling Stone. So I'm assuming some people see you that way, but how about people here in New Mexico? Every newspaper in New Mexico is, a, is our partner. So we also give the same stories. I mean, that was our primary mission from the beginning to the New Mexican and the Albuquerque Journal and you know all the small papers that are owned by Gannett, Farmington, Carl's, Battles, Cruces, et cetera. They all receive our stories. So for instance, there was a story this week, I think we um, published it two days ago and it was about the textbook wars, the textbook battles and um, curriculum, um, social studies curriculum and the battle against, you know, the battle cry of CRT, critical race theory, that's all the rage now. And it was kind of centered in um, Las Cruces. And when I looked at, you know, all the emails this morning, I saw that every newspaper down south had published this story within, a, you know, 24 hours of our having published it. That was a fascinating piece, by the way, um, and really gave us a look at what where critical race theory and that debate stands in the state of New Mexico. I also noticed you did a two part series recently, or maybe just the first part has been published so far on water. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that one. The second part is being published next week. In fact, um, I just started editing the story. Um, so yes, what we hired a full-time environmental reporter back in April. Um, that actually also came out of a national search. She moved here from Colorado. And um, she was among the various stories, she realized quickly that water was, you know, well, she already knew this, but water was so critical. And she discovered that there has been no um, there, there's no effort to collect it, data about water. So nobody really in New Mexico knows how much water is being used, really where it's, you know, where it's um, coming from, how it's being channeled, you know, to the various municipalities. Um, most um, communities don't um, 
keep any measurements of, of their water. So this one town that she focused on, um, Magdalena um, near Socorro, kind of suddenly, um, I think this was a, a few years ago, just ran out of water. Their, their well went dry. And they had no idea because the way that so many um, communities are recording their, you know, and measuring their water is just with, um, you know, like writing it on, on the, in the well house, kind of like, you know, um, in pencil or pen. And then the, you know, when, when it's painted over, all recordings are, you know, completely disappear. Um, she's just come back from, I forget what town it is now, but it's somewhere also down south where she found that the documents for essentially, I don't know, almost a hundred years worth of transactions around water have just, are, are just kind of cataloged in these large binders. Nothing has ever been digitalized. So it, it, it's just an, an enormous problem because they don't even know where the problem, you know, the extent of the problem, much less how to address it. It seems like there's no end to the stories you could write about. So do your journalists come up with the ideas? Do you, do you have staff meetings where you throw around ideas? How, how do you decide what to follow? Well, we actually call it low hanging fruit. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> Kathleen, you, you know that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's more stories than we can possibly attempt. We, we actually, we have um, a, a Google um, document just called ideas in which we're mm -hmm. constantly adding things to potential stories. Um, we meet in a staff meeting every week, every, every Monday morning and discuss story ideas. Um, there's one, I and one other editor are just in constant communication with the reporters. What are you working on? What have you heard? I go through the papers every morning. You know, I just, I'll get up early and just read through every newspaper in New Mexico and try to get to the nationals as well. And like, what are the, you know, what are the stories? What are the issues? How are things changing? And then of course, like one of the things I love, here's a great example of how um, one of our reporters approaches, you know, finding stories. He, he'll go to a support group, say foster care kids who have kind of um, aged out of the system, but they still have issues because, you know, historically foster kids have aged out at 18 years old and suddenly they're abandoned and there's, you know, they don't have money to go to school, they, you know, for rent, for anything, you know, for just basics. So he, for a couple of years, would every week go and hang out with, you know, just with these kids, not because he had a specific story in mind, but just because he wanted to hear what they, you know, what their concerns were. He'd bring in a couple pizzas and some sodas and just sit there and, you know, meet with them. Another piece we, he did the same thing with was um, grandmothers who are raising their grandchildren. It's a huge thing. Like in Espanola, 60 or 65% of grandparents, grandmothers are essentially the, the primary custodian for, for their you know, for grant for the children in Espanola schools. And so he did the same thing. He would just go and, you know, sit in um, support groups with par you know, with parents, uh, with the grandparents. We get tips, you know, increasingly. We get really good tips. People write to us. We have a secure, um, you know, actually we use Signal, the, the um, CYFD's lap, um, app to, um, to communicate and make people feel like they're safe if they want to, you know, send us a tip. Sure. All kinds of ways. You know, the book that you wrote about stage fright, I think is kind of fascinating. So I'd like to know a little bit more about that, but also you're a musician, you play the piano. And I think you've written about how that gives you an emotional connection. And I'm wondering if you get, if you're getting the same thing from some of these searchlight stories, this sort of emotional connection to the community, if there's a tie there between the music and the journalism. Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I think that 
you know, certainly in the right in writing, I mean, I, I you know, in, ryth in the rhythm of language, that's something that I, I, I've always read my stories out loud. Like when I used to work at the Philadelphia Inquirer, I'd be in this huge newsroom and I would be sitting at my desk and like just mumbling and talking to myself because I just, and I tell my reporters that all the time, you have to read your stories out loud because then you're going to hear, you know, when there's a hole, when there's a transition, when a, a sentence is clumsy. So I'm definitely attuned to that. It's very interesting. I've done the same thing. When I've taught journalism, I always say, read it out loud. And you may feel silly, but do it out loud because you'll know you'll know right away if something's yes. wrong. Yes. And also one of the, the last step in every story before we publish, be before it goes live, is I will sit with the reporter and have them read their story out loud to me. And even though it's been copy edited and edited numerous times, they and I will meet, you know, it, it could just be one word that, you know, is changed, but there's often many little changes that get made at the last minute like mm -hmm. that. I guess I have just a final question for you, and that is, um, what is it, you've told us a little bit about what's coming up in terms of the article, the second part on water. Is there anything else that we should have our eyes out for coming up in the next couple of weeks, something any any big stories? Do you want to give us any <laughs> any scoops? Well, the water story is one. Oh, so of course the re real Hamilton and his mother. That will be you know a, I probably it's probably not this week. It's going to be next week. Um, what when we're, we're, real Hamilton and his mother? Real Hamilton. That's Doris Hamilton. Oh, oh okay, okay. Out of the yeah. Guardian, yeah. Yes. Okay. The guardianship program. So. Um, yeah, that will be a significant one. What else? Um, we're doing a story about how they, how people, families have had their electricity turned off, and so how and what how that's going to affect schooling for kids who require remote learning. You know, obviously in, at this time. Oh gosh, well, it's, I, um, I I think that there's many. What I want to do is I want to put in the chat function, and I'll just do it right now, um, the address that you gave us, which is searchlightnm.org uh, slash sign up slash Corrales, so that if people want to get that magazine slash annual report, they know how to do it. So it's right there in the, in the chat function if anybody wants to copy it, and um, you'll get your, you get your own copy. Any other questions, Deborah, that you that yeah, you have? Um, Jenny and Jerry do so have a really uh, very pertinent question. Um, not that they are all pertinent. Um, what are the political backgrounds of your reporters and how do you control bias? I do not ask them for their political backgrounds, just as I wouldn't ask them about their sexual backgrounds or racial backgrounds. Um, but we are really all, I think all sensitive, but especially the editors are extremely sensible, sensitive um, to controlling for bias in stories. And that occasionally that will creep up, not as often as you think, but we're really, it's that happens in the editing process. Though I will also add, it can also occasionally happen in the, in social media. And that's something that okay, of course happens everywhere. You've probably read about problems at the New York Times and the Washington Post and you know beyond where reporters will say something that is you know, maybe says a little too much about their bias in social media on Twitter and Facebook. And they've really paid the price for it at times. And I have to say, we've gotten in trouble a couple times on social media. It's not without its dangers, though it's so important. I wouldn't say that our problems have been specifically po politically related, but they, um, we've gotten bit. 
Mm -hmm. It's very much a double edged sword because on one hand, of course, you want to, your stories to more people to read them. On the other hand, you want to make sure that you're preserving the journalism that you've spent a lot of time and effort producing. Um, I just want to say thank you, Sarah, for sharing the story and the stories of uh, Searchlight New Mexico. And as we've said, if any of you watching are intrigued and you want to learn more, you can visit their website where you can read stories, see videos. You can sign up there to get email links to their reporting. It's searchlightnm.org. And as uh, Sarah said, you can get that annual report at searchlightnm.org, sign up Corrales. Um, before we end, I wanna thank uh, our salon committee. That's my colleagues, Deborah Blank, Hamina Deutsch, Pat DeVivi, and Charlene Spiegel. Mm -hmm. And another shout out to Sandra and Arnold Farley. We really appreciate your sponsorship tonight. Um, today's conversation will be posted on the Corrales Art Center's YouTube channel. And for those of you who are interested, coming up next on Sunday afternoon, March 6th, we have sculptor and ceramic artist and food activist, Roxanne Swensel. Um, you're going to want to save time for this one. Her topic is going to be preserving a Pueblo's past with seeds, and it's her effort to save native crops. And we do expect that that salon will likely be via Zoom. So that's it for the January Salon. Um, thank you again to Sarah Solovich and thanks to all of you for watching. Thank you for having me.